Hi, welcome back for more Money Hungry by Sharon Flake. Today I'm going to read chapter 19 through 23. Chapter 19. As soon as I get home, things start falling apart. Mama is standing in the doorway of our building. She's wearing open-toed bedroom slippers. Raspberry, Mama yells, her fist balled up and her thumb pointed toward the door. Get in this house right now. I move past Mama real slow. She don't take her eyes off me for a minute. I can tell by the way she's looking at me that I got real hollering coming my way. When Mama comes inside behind me, she's madder than before. Mama's hollering, I work two jobs to keep us from living in the street. And you go and steal money? Why? I try to tell Mama I don't know what she's talking about, but she's gone crazy walking from room to room, yelling at me. Next thing I know, she's in my bedroom, pulling out my money drawers, emptying my cash can of stashed bills from the hole in the wall, dumping cash all over the place. I ain't, didn't, raise no thief. I'm walking behind Mama, picking up tens and twenties, shoving quarters into my pockets. Mama turns around and sees what I'm doing. She grabs my hand and pulls open my fingers to get the money. You're hurting me, I yell. But Mama keeps pulling back my fingers. This is going to stop here and now, she says, taking the money and throwing it across the room. I should have made you stop all this money nonsense long before when I seen how crazy it was making you. She puts the can down and goes over to the window. The wind blows the curtains back against the wall. Who said I was a thief? Who said I took their stuff? I say, holding, taking hold of the can. Who said I was a thief? Who took their money? I ask Mama again and again. Mama tells me that it was Janae's grandfather who said I was a thief. He told Mama that every now and then he sneaks a peek at Janae's diary to see what she's up to. This morning he read something about it about me stealing $200 of his money. I'm shaking my head saying that he don't know what he's talking about. I tell Mama it was, for, it was Janae who took the money, not me. Mama looks at me real disappointed like... She turns around and drops a handful of money out the window. I lose it then. I push her out of my way. I scratch my hand trying to get at my money. Mama, no! I yell, looking at my money fall to the ground. Mama is stronger than I am. She takes one hand, pushes me hard, and I end up falling on my butt and hitting my back against the table. I guess you're going to stand here and deny taking that $50 from Janae too? She says, talking about the money I took off Janae's kitchen table table. At first I tell mom I didn't take it. Then I come clean and say I did, but I returned it right away. She shakes her head and sits for a minute on the windowsill. I would rather throw it all away than for you to think it's okay to steal. There are tears running down mama's face. She lets loose another fistful of money. I got a letter from a lawyer today saying that them folks in Pecan Landings don't want us over there. They think we are trash. And you, she says, getting louder, with all your money-hungry ways, you just prove them right. Now I see what this is all about. That money's mine, I say, getting up in Mama's face. I put my hand over hers to make her stop. But even with my hands trying to squeeze hers shut, her fingers uncurl and my money is gone. I hear Shu and other people outside going nuts. I got me a 20, he's saying. Lord, here comes another 10, somebody else says. I try to tell Mama that this is all a big mistake. She's so angry about losing the house, she ain't listening to me. She throws the empty can on my bed and starts grabbing handsful, handfuls of loose change from the top of my dresser drawer. Next thing I know, I hear it bouncing off the pavement, flying off cars. For a minute, I don't, know, I don't try to stop Mama anymore. I think that maybe if I act like it don't matter, she will quit but it's hard for me to act like I don't care. Mama empties two whole cans of money before she stops. I figure she just gave away $200 of my cash. Check, and anybody else out there better give me back my stuff, I yell out the window. Mama pulls me back inside by my shirt. I will throw it all out, every last penny. If you don't get yourself together, she says. She opens her mouth wide to say something else, but closes it when the phone rings. I look at her and go to answer it. The machine will pick it up, she says, 
holding me back with her arm like a crossing guard does at the light. I walk over to the window. People are still waiting for more of my money to fall. Check's got a stick digging around in the dirt looking for my stuff. Mama's got another fistful of my dollars in her hand. She's headed for the window. When I try to trip her, I smack the money out her hand at the same time. She gives me a look that lets me know she will knock me out if I keep doing what I'm doing. So I stop and pray to God that she will cut it out. When the answering machine pick up, picks up, we hear Janae's grandfather's voice. He's apologizing to Mama and me, saying he talked to Janae about her diary, and she said he misunderstood what he wrote. It was Janae who took the money out my drawer, he says, sounding embarrassed. She's the thief, not your girl. Mama takes a big breath and sits down on my bed. I was so upset about not getting the house. Then Janae's grandfather called about you stealing money. I lost my head, I guess, she says. She's shaking her head from side to side, saying she's sorry for throwing my money away. She starts talking to me in words, soft and sweet as pudding. But I bust out crying when Mama holds me tight. She reminds me again and again that things have a way of turning out. And I know she's right, but deep down inside, I'm still, still scared. Because without money, you ain't nothing. And people can do anything they want to you. Chapter 20. No sooner than I start cleaning up what's left of my money, Dr. Mitchell comes over. He looks nervous leaving his car on the street with everybody standing around like they're waiting for something more to happen. And before he's inside our place, two kids is sitting on the hood of his ride. Soon as Mama sees Dr. Mitchell, tears come. She tells him about being turned away from Pecan Landings and about throwing my money around. Dr. Mitchell's got his arms around Mama. He's standing in the middle of the room holding her tight, telling her everything will be all right. Mama's crying real hard and she can't stop. I know it sounds weird, but I feel better, safer with Dr. Mitchell around. Dr. Mitchell asks me for towels. He wants Mama to lay in her bed and cool down before she makes herself really sick. I'm watching him take care of her, putting towels in cool water and pressing them on her forehead, putting on nice music and shutting her bedroom door so she can rest. For once, I'm jealous of Zora. When Dr. Mitchell offers to help me straighten up the place, I turn him down, but he acts like I ain't said a word. He grabs a broom and starts sweeping up, then starts talking about how someday things will be better for Mama and me. There's just a bunch of trifling snobs down in Pekin Landings, I snap. Dr. Mitchell takes, shakes his head and walks over to the window. He plays with the change in his pocket, taps on the window and tells the people to get off his ride. When things settle down, I'll take your mother to City Hall. We'll talk to people there. File a complaint if she wants, he says. Then Dr. Mitchell opens the window and says, Now don't make me have to come down there. I said get off my car. I'm tired of not having ever sp I'm tired of not having ever spoken to Dr. Mitchell about his thing with Mama. So I ask him straight up, Are you in love with my mom or what? I don't cut him no slack. I don't try to help him out by making small talk or changing the subject. I need to know, and he's going to tell me. Dr. Mitchell, Mickle, ugh. Dr. Mitchell jerks up his pant legs when he goes down to sit down. Then he scratches his head and clears his throat. I like your mom, Raspberry. That's all he says. But you dating her, right? I ask. I like your mother a whole lot. She likes me, but she won't make a solid commitment to me he says, turning toward me. Says she's too busy trying to make something out of herself to get fully involved with me. I'm thinking, Mama must be nuts, turning down a doctor, a smart, nice guy with big cash, and her living in the projects and holding down two jobs. So why are you all up under her, I ask. Company, he says. Friendship. Good conversation, I guess. He talks more than he ever did to me before. Telling me about Mama, how smart and strong she is, how determined she is to do something good with her life. We have the same values, you know. He says, standing up and getting busy again. We love our families, work hard, and try to do what's right. His beeper goes off and he pulls out out of his pocket to check the phone number. Zora, he says, I need to give her a call. While he's in the kitchen on the phone, I get, my, get on my hands and knees to pick up more of my money. 
All I find is $10 and change. Dr. Mitchell says he's got to be heading home soon, but it's another hour before he goes. He spends some time at Mama's bedside, wiping her forehead with the washcloth. Finally, he says goodbye to me. Take care of your Mama. Tell her I'll call her soon, he says. Mama wakes up as soon as she hears Dr. Mitchell close the front door behind him. In a little while, she's in the kitchen, pulling out frying pans and making dinner. I don't have no appetite, but I watch her flour up the chicken, melt down the lard, and put the good plates and silverware on the table. After a while, we're sitting down, but we're not eating the food, not talking. I'm playing with a string unraveling from my mama's pink tablecloth, digging in my pocket for the money I made earlier today at Miss Baker's boarding house. Thinking about what that old man said to me, money won't never do you wrong. Chapter 21. The first person I see when I jump out Mama's car and walk up the steps to school is Janae. Me and her already had it out on the telephone about her putting me in her diary. But I believe her when she says her granddad got it all wrong. She's with Ming. I don't have time to play around, so I just say what I mean. Give me what you owe me, I tell Janae with my hand out. You know Zora ain't speaking to you, she says, walking up the steps with Ming's arm around her shoulder. Don't talk to me about Zora. Just give me my money back, I say, matching every step she takes. Ming looks at me and says that I should chill. Janae asks him to go to her locker and get her science book. I start to explain to Janae that I'm just about broke. But Janae already knows that. Shu and Chek have been telling everybody about how all my money came pouring out the window. Janae, I put my hand out, give me back the money I lent you. Now, Janae's shaking her head. Her long, shiny spiral curls pat the sides of her face every time she moves. She tells me that the person who owes her money ain't paid it back yet. Give me the money we made at Miss Baker's or sell Ming's jacket. Take the jacket to a pawn shop or sell it on the corner. Do what you gotta, but get my money. Today, I yell. Ming walks back over to us. Sato's right behind him. Seneca and Kevin are there too. I don't want to embarrass Janae and Ming, but I got to have that money. I can't be walking around broke. So I forget about him and her and just let him know that I know Janae's got, got him that jacket with money that wasn't hers. And I want that money back now. You are so lame, Sato says, walking up to me. Lame and greedy, he says, letting loose a smile so sweet I could just die. Embarrassing Ming in front of the whole school, busting on your friend. All for a few pennies. <sighs> oh, no, I lost my place. All for a few pennies, he says, shaking his head and walking off. Don't nobody care Janae owes me $200 and don't want to pay up? Don't nobody care that I'm practically broke? Ming is staring me down, holding on to Janae's hand tight and giving me an evil look. She didn't buy me the coat, he says, playing with his baby ring. I'll tell her, Janae says to him. Then she lowers her voice and looks me in the face. The coat was Willie's, my cousin who died last year from an asthma attack. Janae looks down on the floor. Ming didn't want no one to know, she says even lower, because my cousin had the jacket on when he died. Ming's looking down at his feet, still holding tight to Janae's fingers. When he and Janae start to walk off, a cotton ball falls off from her someplace. She steps on it, and I never do see it again. I need my money, I say, following behind her. I need my money. I need my money. Kevin's copying me, getting all up in my business. Sell some pencils, he says. Or rotten chocolate, Seneca says, laughing. I look at Janae. I want to ask her what happened to the money she took from her granddad, but she's walking off with me. Seneca is with, right with her, holding back, looking back at me every once in a while. She's got a smirk on her face. Kevin's got his arms around her shoulders. They all turn the corner at once. I'm watching them go. I'm watching my money go for good, too. I'm standing there trying to figure out what it's going to take to get Janae to shake loose my cash when she comes running back my way. She smells like baby powder and peaches. The money, she says, breathing hard, the money wasn't for Ming. It was for my mother. I am tired of Janae with her stories, so I ask her again when she'll be able to pay me. 
Next thing I know, Jenny's digging in her purse, pulling out dollars, throwing me, throwing them my way. You cheap, greedy thing, she says, throwing money at me like it ain't nothing. I told you I didn't have the money. Why couldn't you just leave me be? Why couldn't you just trust me? She says, still digging in her purse. I don't wait for kids to do like they did when mama lost her mind and threw my money out the window. I get down on my hands and knees and stuff the money in my book bag. I stop counting when I get to 35 bucks. Janae is bugging, I say to Mai when I see her in the hall later on. I tell Mai about the money Janae threw at me. Mai is walking down the hall looking at herself in a hand mirror. <sighs> Why don't you give Janae a break, she asks. You are just so greedy. I point my finger in Mai's face and say, What's that supposed to mean? Mai takes a deep breath and shakes her head. First you take that 50 from Janae, then you start harassing her about paying you back. What's mine is mine. I say, Janae getting, I say, getting louder. Mai keeps staring at herself in the mirror. Kevin and Seneca walk by. Kevin says to Mai, hey, karate kid. Him and Seneca think that's real funny. Here come, then here comes Sato. He's asking if I got a pencil he can buy. While I'm looking in my bag for one, he says he heard that me and Mama gonna be kicked out to the curb, living on the streets again. I swallow hard. I want to say that what he heard is just talk, but I ain't sure. That's why getting the money, Janae, that's why I got to get the money Janae owes me. Why well, I got to figure out a way to replace what Mama threw out the window. Chapter 22. I got too much on my mind to be a 13-year-old. That's why I'm thinking, that's what I'm thinking on the bus ride home. So I make a decision. I'm going to stop thinking about how Janae and me are mad at each other. Stop thinking about the house me and Mama ain't going to get and the people who don't want us to live there. I'm going to forget about Mama and Dr. Mitchell too. I'm going to forget everything but filling up my money drawer again and keeping Mama and me off the streets. It's nice out today. Don't nobody want to be inside, not even me. So I get off the bus a few blocks early and take my time getting home. The weather done gone crazy. The temperature shot up to 75, even though spring is a ways off. Just like that, it's nice enough for people to be driving around with their hatchbacks up or sitting out playing cards and talking trash. The closer I get to my place, the noisier the world seems. People are talking at the top of their lungs, laughing like jokes is funny around here than anywhere else on earth. Blasting their car stereos like they throw in a party and want everybody else to come. But it's all good, because around here, there's always somebody to look at and somebody else's music to listen to. When I turn the corner, Odd Job, our neighborhood car washer, is selling, washer is doing his thing, making cars shine, selling frozen Kool-Aid in cups and hawking fans that blow cold, that blow water. Soon as I walk up, he tells me to take a frozen icy, but he keeps right on wiping the windshield of somebody's town car. Raspberry treat, he shouts, looking my way. What's shaking, girl? I halfway smile at him and reach my hand inside the cooler for a blue icy. I rub the cool cup on my sweaty forehead, then lick till my tongue turns blue. Odd job is quick on his feet, moving from car to car, waving one of the guys over to the car that just pulled up, telling the woman inside she gets a free wash because she's looking so fine. Odd job pulls out his money, a roll of bills as fat as a hoagie. When I see all that cash, my mouth starts watering. I lick my lips and try not to look so greedy. Better watch it, odd job. Raspberry will take all your dollars, Shoe says, walking up. Shoe reaches into the cooler and grabs an icy too. You better pay up. I ain't running no credit union, odd job says to him. Shoe slides his hands down into his pants pocket and comes up with a handful of chain. I'm paying up today, Shoe says, handing over the money. How much I owe you? Shoes acting like he's grown, walking with a dip, finger in the change in his pocket like a man. You owe me too much, Odd Job says, taking the change without counting a dime of it. Plenty here where that came from. Plenty, Shoes says. He heads across the street to the supermarket. He got the nerve to come back later with a giant sized bag of barbecue chips and swearing he ain't sharing them with nobody. I want to punch him in the face. I know it's my money he's spending. Odd job's working hard. He got sweat dripping down the side of his face and soaking the top of his pants, right underneath where the belt is. 
but he don't stop moving. He keeps washing them cars. I'm sitting here watching him. My tongue is blue from the icy that dribbled down the front of my shirt. I can't help but wonder how much money he makes in a day. Odd job must have read my mind. You here to make some money? He asks. I could use a few pennies in my pocket, I say, remembering how I used to help him out when Mama and me first moved around here. Odd job throws me a wet rag. I scrub windows clean with vinegar and water. Hustling hand fans right along with him. By the time I finish, it's dark out. And I know I'm in trouble because I missed my curfew. On the way home, I count my money five times. I figure I can double it if I buy up pencils from the dollar store and sell them for 25 cents each. So I go to the dollar store and buy a whole bunch of pencils. When I get home, Shoes, grandma's la Shoes Grandma lays me out as soon as I put the key in the door. Raspberry, your mother's going crazy calling around looking for you, she says, leaning over in her wheelchair and hollering downstairs at me. And look at you, just look, she says, frowning up her face and shaking a head full of curlers. I look down at my chest. My white shirt has got a big, got a fat black smudges on it from me leaning against those dirty cars. Your mama is worried sick about you, she says. She got her hands full enough and you ain't making things no easier for her, you wild, selfish thing. She starts back in her wheelchair into her apartment. I can hear the wheels squeaking. Selfish, selfish, selfish. That is what you is, she says, slamming the door behind her. Chapter 23. Today, Odd Job is talking my ears off, working me hard, too. By the time it's dark, I got $30 in my po pocket, including what I made at school selling more pencils. My arms ache so bad I can hardly pick up my backpack. The 10 minute walk from Odd Job's corner to home seems like an hour. It's getting nicer out every day, and everybody and their mother is out here, including Shu, whose grandmother is hollowing out the window for him to get in the house. He's sitting on the chair Mama left in the street to hold the parking spot. There's a bunch of boys, including Czech, out there with him. One of them tries to trip me when I go by. Punk, I say, rolling my eyes at him. Then getting real smart, I ask them why they gotta be sitting in front of our door, making it hard for people to get inside. Chuck tells me to be quiet. Shoe throws an empty pop bottle my way. Their grandmother is still yelling for them to come inside the house. When I step inside the building, the hallway is pitch black. The light bulb is out. I hold the door open with my book peg so the street light will help me see better. I look back at Shoe and Chuck. I can see in their faces that they don't care. I doubt they'd even pee on me if I was on fire. I drag my hands across the hallway walls, trying to feel our way to the front, my way to the front door. I'm walking slow, looking around me, wondering if somebody is hiding behind the steps or by the door, swallowing hard when I see that our front door ain't locked like it was like when I left home. It's open and it's pitch black in there. I cut on the light and push the door open wider. I call for mama, thinking maybe she came home early. A funny noise comes out of my mouth when I get it mouth when I get inside and see what I see. Our couch is gone, the microwave is gone, and so is the television. I'm smart enough not to go any further. I back out the door and run upstairs to check grandmother's place to call the police. Mama shows up before they come. She goes through the apartment holding my hand. Oh, I can't believe this, she says. I pry her fingers loose and run back to check on my stash. I open the drawer and see the cans turned over every which way. Empty. I look under the mattress, but they got the rest of it. Every last penny. Slowly, I go back to the room, to the other room where Mama is sitting on the floor. Mama always knows what to do, but she's sitting there now, crying with me, saying she don't know if she can go on no more. And I don't either. I, I keep trying to hold on to be strong, but I'm tired, Lord. She yells, shh. She goes to the window and pulls it wide open. I'm tired, she's screaming, sick and tired. I go to Mama and put my head on her chest. We hold each other, and we both make the same sounds when we cry, like a tired baby that's been crying a long time. Because, shh, because nobody cared enough to come see about it. Mama wipes both our faces and sits on the windowsill. Shh, come here. Chuck and Shu are still out there. So are lots of other people. They're playing craps, bunched up on steps in front of the boarded up place across the way. 
Some girl is jiggling her butt to music coming from a car parked on the pavement. Three boys circle around her and they take turns trying to outdance her. Somebody out there got our stuff, Raspberry, Mama says, sounding mad now, walking over to the cabinets, pulling them open two at a time. She grabs boxes of cereal, bags of rice, plastic ketchup packets, anything she gets her hands on. You should have just took it all, she says, going over to the window and throwing out our food. She leans herself out the window and screams louder than anything. You should have took everything. I pe hear people outside cursing, saying we better not come down there if we know it's good for us. I sit at the table thinking that Mama's just making it worse and worse. She goes over to the front door and props a kitchen chair under the doorknob. We can't stay here no more, she says. Even if we get the locks, fix locks fixed, they will come back again. We, we are sitting ducks now. I tell her that we can't let people run us off. But she says we can't stay now that our place has been hit. And here, and you hear, and you hear always alone. Sooner or later, something really bad will happen. Jack and Shu are still outside. I see she, I see Shu pointing at our window when I go over to pull the shade down. We got to travel light, like before. Mama says, fingering a broken plate. Just a few things. Only what we need. I look at her like she's crazy. Like before? I say. My heart speed up. She turns my way and holds my face in her hands. Just come with me. We going back to the streets? I say, reaching into my pocket for my stash. Not me, I yell, walking across the room. Not me. I got money. I say, pulling dollars and change out of my pocket. See? I say, pushing money in her face. Mama pushes my hand away. We're lucky. Spring is on the way. A few blankets to keep the evening chill off of us, and we'll be okay. She says, go into her bedroom, stuff in pants and work clothes in a green plastic bag, not seeing until it's too late, me standing there wetting myself like a baby. Mama peels off my wet pants, hands me a towel, and tells me to throw everything in the plastic trash bag. I'll hand wash them before we go. Go where? I ask, while she pulls my shirt over my head, almost pulling my face off, too. Mama doesn't answer. She bends down and tells me to lift up my foot. She takes my socks off and stuffs all the clothes into the bag. Why can't we stay with somebody for a while? Maybe Janae, Mai, or Zora? She shakes her head, sticks her hand inside the shower, and turns on the hot water. Don't you remember what it was like before, Mama asks, people getting mad because we ate too much of their food, dropping hints that they wanted us out their place. I look at my leg. There's a trail of pee from my thigh to my ankle. I rub it with my hand at first, grab a wet rag, and rub it till my skin stings. I ain't living on the streets no more, I say, feeling like I gotta pee on myself all over again. I'll do foster care before I do that. Mama's eyes let me know that she didn't like what I just said to her but her voice is still warm and soft, like the scene filling up the bathroom and fogging up the mirror. She pulls back the shower curtain and hands me the soap. I can take care of you, she says when I step into the shower. Before I close the curtain, I ask why we can't stay in a hotel. We gotta save money, Mama says. I got money, I say, jumping out the shower, run into my room to dig in my pants pocket. I run back to the bathroom with money balled up in my hand. Here, here's $150. We can stay someplace nice for a while. I say, giving Mama my money. My own Mama smiles at the money in my hand, in her hand. She pulls back the shower curtain and says for me to get inside. We better hold on to this, she says, pulling the curtain closed behind me. We don't know what the day will bring. This is all your fault, I scream. You threw away my money, made them come after us. I say, feeling the steam. You're the reason we had to live on the streets in the first time, I cry. If it wasn't for you, we would still have our own place, not be living in the projects in the streets and being scared of doing without. I know it ain't true, some of the things I'm saying, but I can't stop the words or the tears. For ten more minutes, I yell and scream and cry and tell Mama that I ain't never going to be like her when I grow up. I'm going to have money. I'm going to take care of my children. I'm going to keep them safe. It don't take no time for the water to go cold and for the steam to disappear from the bathroom. When I step out the shower, Mama is there, helping to wipe me down, reminding me to brush my teeth, telling me everything will be all right. On the news, they call it breaking and entering. 
but I don't remind my mother of that. She already knows that what we're doing is wrong. I watch out for the neighbors when mama takes a screwdriver and breaks the glass window to the kitchen door at the house at Pecan Landings. It's the middle of the night. We got a keychain flashlight shining on the floor in front of our feet so we can see where we're going. I'm holding mama's arm tight. We drop the bags, get on our knees to dig pillows and blankets out the biggest, one of the biggest bags. Mama covers me up and kisses me goodnight. She's snoring as soon as she, she's snoring almost as soon as she rolls over, taking most of the covers with her. I can't sleep. I try, but it's too quiet. At night, I'm used to hearing radios thumping, dogs fighting, or somebody cussing somebody out. But here at Pecan Landings, it's like everything is dead. I get up and crawl over the window to look at outside. Nobody is hanging out on the street corners or sitting on their front steps. Nothing is moving. I go back over to Mama and tell her to give me some of the covers. She sits up, quick, looks around like she don't know where she is, shakes her head and smiles at me. She lays back down, pulling some of the covers cover off her and putting it onto me. Go to sleep, she says, putting her arm around me. I close my eyes and I'm back on the streets again, dreaming that same old dream. I'm too tired to wake myself up. So I pushed the cart. All night long, I pushed the cart. <laughs>